I'm glad you're here with us this morning. I'm glad you're online with us this morning. I, I'm excited as we continue to walk through the book of John, how God is kind of unfolding this story in front of us of who, who God is and who we are in relationship with Him. And as we move into this time today, the passage that we're going to be looking at, I want to take us back to last week because what we see is we see Jesus telling the disciples, listen, I'm about to leave you. I asked you to follow me. You began following me, and now I'm leaving you, and you can't follow me where I'm going right now. And then he tells Peter, Peter said, man, I, I will go and I'll die for you. And Jesus says, you're not going to die for me. In fact, you're going to deny me three times. So it's not ending well. It's not, everything's not happening to, to the degree that it should. And the disciples are probably standing there saying, this isn't what I expected whenever I chose to follow this rabbi, this, this guy. I, I was expecting something else. And I don't know if you've been at that place, but this is where the disciples are. And then we get into the beginning of chapter 14, which we're going to be looking at. And this is what Jesus says. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. What he's saying to them is, listen, hold on. Don't stress out. Don't worry. Now, I got to ask you, if you've had, ever had anyone in your life walk up to you and you're at that place where you're kind of worrying about something and you're struggling with something and somebody walks up to you and said, hey, don't worry about that. How well did that work? <laughs> Not well. I've learned some things in being a husband. And one of the things I've learned is there are times I just need to keep my mouth shut. Because there are some times that I just, I walk up to Marcy and I'm like, you don't need to worry about that. Or I'll say, don't take that personally. And she'll look at me and go, how can I not take it personally? They said it to me. And I've learned that's not really a wise thing to say. But that's what Jesus says. And so if you have somebody in your life that walks up to you and says, don't worry about it, then you need to take into consideration who they are, what kind of relationship you have with them, and you need to decide whether or not you're going to listen to them or not. But if the Son of God, fully God and fully man, walks into your space and says, let not your hearts be troubled, you may want to listen. Now what Jesus does in this passage is he knows where the disciples are, he knows what they're struggling with, and so I believe that he's trying to bring them to a place of confidence and peace in who they are. And so Jesus starts with, let not your hearts be troubled. And then we go on in chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Jesus says this, believe in God, believe also in me. So Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. And then it's like the first step, and I don't think Jesus was going step one, two, and three, but it's like the first step is believe in God and also believe in me. Now, if you're a Jew, then to hear this thing, believe in God, you're like, oh yeah, I mean, we do that anyway. That's what we do. That's, that's who we are. We believe in God. But then Jesus added that, that caveat, that addendum, which says, also believe in me. And what he's saying to these 11 disciples that are left, he's saying this, he said, you have believed in me before, keep believing in me because you're going to need it. They had no idea what was coming. They didn't know Jesus was going to the cross. They just know, knew that he was going to leave and they couldn't follow him anymore. We got the end of the story. We know more of what's going on. And so Jesus says to them, believe in God and also believe in me. And if you're going through a difficult time right now, and if you're struggling, and if your heart's troubled, and if you're wrestling with that, and I know that some of you today are wrestling with a troubled heart significantly, which really has little to do with a great thing in the world, but it has to do with a little football pigskin thing. But some of you are wrestling with this troubled heart thing. But if you're wrestling with something that, is, that you're feeling like is just bringing you down and taking you to, in, into the abyss and you can't get out of it, you can't get your head above water, you, can't, you, you feel like you're drowning in what's going on in your life, I just want you to hear the words of Jesus because he's speaking it to the ones who are in the same place. And he says this, believe in God and also believe in me. Now, there's some of us that will sit there and go, okay, I got that. I believe in God. But here's my concern. My concern is what our understanding of belief has become. Our understanding of belief has become to give mental assent, to have this mental understanding of belief. But that's not what belief is. 
Belief is to understand something to be true and then act upon it. See, all of you walked into this space and you sat down in these chairs, these new comfortable chairs. Thank you for that. But you sat down in these new comfortable chairs and not one of you got down on your hands and knees and looked at the foundation and the framework of the chairs because we could have cut them. We could have gone in there and just sawed off a little bit and it would have fallen over when you sat down. But you didn't do that because you trusted the chair and you sat down in the chair. You got in vehicles, and you got in the vehicle, and you turned the key as if it was supposed to start. You believed that that vehicle was going to start. You believed the vehicle would get you here because you trusted and believed in that. You see, here's the thing. There are a lot of people that say they believe in Jesus, and yet when it comes down to really trusting in Jesus and acting upon it, we don't. And I had a confession in the first service, and I'll share it with you in this service. I do not believe in parachutes because you will never find me getting into a perfectly good plane and putting a piece of tent fabric on my back and jumping out of that perfectly. I don't believe that 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 piece of fabric will hold this. I just don't believe it. It will. I know I had somebody came and told me they had jumped out 168 times and I applauded them and praise God for you. I don't believe it. Now, I did tell him, I think I'm justifying my fear by saying I don't believe it, but I don't believe it because I'm not going to act on it. But that's what a lot of us do with Jesus. We say we believe in Jesus. We profess it with our mouth. But our actions don't reflect that. And Jesus said, if you don't want your heart to be troubled, believe in God and also believe in me. Do you believe in God? Do you believe that he's capable? Do you believe that he's big enough? Y'all think about the things that we believe in. Think about all the things that we believe in. We'll go through life and say, if I can just get to this point in life, then it's going to be better. If I can have just this amount of money that will allow me to do this or allow us to do this, then I'll be better. If I could just have this person in my life, then everything would be better. Man, if I just didn't have this one thing, this one thorn of my flesh in my life, everything would be better or something that's really prevalent today that we need to be processing and thinking through. Man, if this one person would be elected president, everything would be fixed. I just want to make it really clear. That's a lie. It doesn't matter who's sitting in that chair. Everything will not be fixed. They are not God. Or maybe if we can get this one person confirmed into the Supreme Court, then everything will be beautiful. It's not true. Because you're dealing with a flawed nature of humanity. Jesus says, believe in God. Don't believe in the Supreme Court. Don't believe in uh, a political party. Don't believe in a certain person. Don't believe that a certain amount of money is going to get you there. Don't believe any of that. Believe in God and also believe in me. And it's just like hard stop, drop the mic, finished. Do you believe in Jesus? How is that reflected in your actions? We're going to unpack that a little bit more a little later in, in the message. And then Jesus says this, which seems to be an odd twist, an odd turn in the passage. But he says this, verse 2, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'll go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. What Jesus is saying is he's saying, listen, there's a place away from here and you are so caught up in what's happening here that you have forgotten that all this is about eternity. It's not about here. This is not the end result. And so I'm going to prepare a place for you and and my father's house has many rooms and so I'm going to go take care of that. And what he's saying is I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die for you so that you have access to the father again because the father has a house that has many many rooms that's available to those who are following him. And you know what that's saying? Do you know where where that puts your heart at ease? So what you're saying is, this isn't it? 
y'all, there are a lot of people in our world right now who somehow think this is it. And I just want us to think about that. Is that really what you want? What's going on in our world today, is, is that okay with it being it? And we step into it and we're like, no, no, but we'll fix it. We'll fix it. And God's saying, no, no, it's not going to be fixed until I come back. But Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place. Y'all, we've forgotten that there is eternity with God. We're rooted in this temporary world. We're grabbing hold of the dirt as if we own it, as if it's what, as if it's what God has for us. No, God has something so much more for us. So why don't we, why don't we have a better understanding of heaven? Why don't we have a better understanding of eternity? I've talked to so many people that have come up to me and go, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm really going to like heaven. I mean, are all we going to do is stand up there and sing? <laughs> it's just going to be, I mean, and, and then I'm, I'm around people who can't really carry a tune. Hopefully, hopefully there will be auto-tune in heaven. <laughs> is that what it's going to be? Y'all, we've lost sight of the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to go prepare the place. What do you think of Jesus? If Jesus is the one who's going to go prepare the place, if Jesus is the one who's going to go prepare your room and put the little chocolate on your pillow, figuratively speaking, I don't know that that's going to happen, but you have your own room. But here's here's what we have. In In our mind, we think we're going to have a mansion. We think we're going to have our own little mansion. And actually, most of us think we're going to have a big mansion. And we think that we're going to be able to go in and out of our mansion whenever we choose. And we're going to be able to close the door and close the garage door just like we do now and keep the people out that we want to keep out and let the people in that we want to let in. And I just want to tell you, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says the Father's house, and it's the Father's house. It's not yours, not mine. The Father's house has many rooms, and he's going to go prepare the house. You see, in that culture, what would happen is whenever the son became betrothed to a woman, the father would go and build a new room onto the house so that they're all living together. Now, that's freaking some of y'all out right now. You're thinking, we got to live with everybody? I mean, can't we just have a nice hotel where I got my room, and I can go downstairs, and I can eat the continental breakfast and the good waffles, and I can go back to my room and close the door and keep, no, no, everybody's in the house. There's going to be a common area and you're going to have your room and I'm going to have my room and we're going to be in this together because that's what the father's house is. You see, we're called to be family. We're called to be family in this thing. Remember, he says the father's house, which means when you and I follow Jesus, we become sons and daughters of the most high God. I don't know if that sets your heart at ease. I don't know if that decreases the troubleness of your heart, but I just want to tell you that where we are right now and the life that we're living right now is not it. That God's got something so much bigger and so much greater for us. But I don't want to disregard the fact that that we can experience heaven on earth. We prayed it just a minute ago. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to talk about how that happens in a couple of weeks. But God's got something more for you. And a lot of times we don't buy into it because we're so rooted here. We think, this is it, man. I, if, I can just get, if I can just get one more dollar, one more Benjamin, if I can just get that, everything's going to be great. And it's not true. Some of the wealthiest people alive are some of the most miserable people. And we need to get away from this idea that we're going to have a house the size of Bill Gates' house, 66,000 square feet. You're going to be a room next to somebody else, all under the roof of the Father. And I don't know how it was in your house, but in my home, If you were living at home under his roof, it was under his rules. So Jesus has painted this picture that he's going to prepare a place and he's going to take care of it for us and he's going to open up the veil so that we can have access back to the Father. The very purpose that we were created for is to have relationship with the God of all creation because he loves you and is passionate for you and desires that with you. That relationship. And then he says this phrase, 
He says, you know the way. You know the way. Now, these disciples, I don't know if they were the brightest in the world, but they weren't, they weren't bad. And Jesus is like, you know the way. And it's kind of like he gave a little wink going, you know, like whenever I raise the guy from the dead, that, that's, that's the way. Remember when I walked on water and I, 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 I rose above all the natural laws of creation? That's who I am. Look at me. But the disciples who've been walking with him for two and a half years still wrestled with it. Now, in their defense, we have the end of the story. We know where Jesus went. He went to the cross, died for us. And so we got that. They don't have that yet. And so Thomas shows up in the story and he says this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we, don't, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas is like, how are we supposed to know this? And Jesus I can see Jesus wanting to look at Thomas and saying, Thomas, I've said the entire time in my ministry that I'm doing the work of the Father, that everything that I'm saying is by the authority of the Father. Everything's pointing back to the Father. It's to glorify the Father. Thomas, the way and where I'm going is to the Father, and I'm the way. I just told you that I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. What part of that do you not understand, Thomas? Thomas? But Jesus says a beautiful thing in that passage. He says this. He says, do you not think I'm going to come back and get you? Why would I go prepare a place and not come back? But he says, he comes back and he says, I'm going to come back and take you to myself. He doesn't say I'm going to come back and invite you into this. He says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you to myself. And the image I have is a father with their child. And as they're walking into a new place, the, child kind of, the father kind of brings the child to his side and says, we're going to go into this together. I'm going to bring you to myself. It's not just this random, okay, yeah, whatever. No, it is very intentional and purposeful. I love you. I care for you. And we're going to go in this together. And Thomas is like, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know, how do we know the way? And Jesus makes this profound statement that I think is one of the most important statements in Scripture. And Jesus says this, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. That's very important to us today because we live in a world that has this relativism and this pluralism and this idea of my truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. As long as we get along, all that's okay and we don't even get along anymore. And it's this idea that there's, there, there are multitudes of truths out there. And Jesus is like, no, you got to understand, I am the way, me, no one else. No other way, me. And y'all, there's no other religion that exists that has one who gave up their life freely for the sake of all of humanity so that we could be restored back into relationship with God. It is Jesus. That's it. And Jesus said, I'm the way and it's only through me that you're going to get back to the Father. But what we do is we do this. We say, okay, Jesus is Google Maps. And we're following his way for a period of time. And then all of a sudden, someone tells us about Waze. And Waze is just an incredible app because Waze will get you around difficult places. It'll get you around where congestion and traffic is. And so you're like, okay, God, that's really good that you sent the Google map way, but I'm going to find my own way around. And it's going to take me through this neighborhood and through this other thing. I'm going to go the Waze map, even though Jesus is the Google map. You know we do it because Jesus says, don't, this, this is how you're supposed to live. And we're like, that sounds really good. And that, that could be good for other people. But I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down Waze map. Do you know how well that works? I just want to give you an example of this. Have you ever been at the grocery store and there's that one person, and it may be you, there's that... <laughs> There's that one person that pulls in front of the grocery store and parks their car kind of in front of the door so that they can let the person out, but they don't leave. They stay there. And they wait for the person to run in and get one, the one item that they're there to get and then to run back out. And their car's just sitting there, parked in front of the front door. And my thought all the time is, what if everyone did that? What if everyone did that? I've wanted to do it. I've wanted to come alongside them, and they're sitting there at the front door, and I've wanted to pull right alongside, right here on the side, and go, this is awesome. 
We should do this all the time. And there are times that Jesus says, live your life like this. Or Jesus says, this is who I am. Trust in me. And we're like, that sounds really good. And that's good for other people. But I'm using ways. Jesus said that he is the way to the Father. Period. Do you believe in him? Do you trust him? Then he says that he is the truth. Notice he doesn't say, I'm a truth of many. He doesn't say, I'm a truth of a multitude of other truths. He said, I am the truth, the only truth, nothing but the truth, so help me, me. That's what, that's what Jesus says. He says, I am the truth. But we have all these people around going, no, but my truth, my truth should be relevant, and my truth should matter. And it's like, your opinion matters, but your truth is not necessarily true. I had one student one time I was, I was sitting in a meeting with, and, and they said, this is what I should be doing, and this is what should be happening, and this is what God, and this and this. And I just stopped, and I said, I don't, I don't agree. How could you say that? You're invalidating me. I said, I'm not invalidating you. I heard everything that you said. I'm responding to what you said. I just don't agree. And that's kind of what God says. You may think that's best for you. You may think that's the best way for you to live. You may think those are best choices for you. I don't agree. And I am the way and the truth. Do you believe in Jesus? Putting your full weight and trust in him. Believing that he is everything that he said he was and that God is everything that he said he is. That he is the first, the last, beginning, the end. That he is all powerful. That he is all knowing. That he is trustworthy. Do you believe it? One of the greatest images that I've, that I've ever heard in regard to this is a guy who was a tightrope walker and he walked across the Niagara Falls pushing a wheelbarrow and he got to the other side and he said, hey, how many of y'all think I could do it again? And they're like, yeah, you could do it again. He's like, do you really think I could do it again? And they're like, yeah, you could do it again. And he said, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? <laughs> Actually, somebody got in the wheelbarrow and he took him back across. That person believed. There's an article that came out by Barner Research. I want to read you some statistics that to me are very disturbing, but probably are very applicable not only to people in this room, but people online. It says that although 61% of American millennials consider themselves to be Christian, just 2%, 2 of them were found to hold a biblical worldview. 2%. Of millennials. Only an estimated 9% of adults in both the elder group, 75 and older, and the boomer group, 56 to 74 years of age, hold a biblical worldview. Only 9%. Among Generation X, 37 to 55 years of age, the percentage of subscribers to a biblical worldview drops to 5%. 2%, 9%, 5%. And I sit there and I read that and I'm like, oh, that hurts. But if we look around, we can see that's true. Do you know how big the millennial generation is? It's the largest generation that existed up until I think Gen Z or I can't remember, but it was a large, one of the largest generations. And I can tell you that within churches, we probably have just enough chairs to seat the millennial generation. Not to mention the elder generation, the boomer generation, and Gen X. You see, there are a lot of people that give, that give lip service to believing in Jesus. There are a lot of people that say, oh, I believe in Jesus. Absolutely, I believe in him. But I don't believe everything. I don't believe everything. And you may be sitting there thinking, what is a biblical worldview? And I'm glad you asked because I'm going to share it with you. There were six components in this research of a biblical worldview. The first is this, that Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Number one. Number two, 
God is all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, and he still rules the universe today. He didn't set it in motion and step away. Number three, three. Salvation is a gift from God and cannot be earned. There's nothing that you can do. You can't be good enough to earn it. Salvation is a gift from God, period. Number four, Satan is real. Number five, a Christian has a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with other people. And number six, and I think this is the kicker, the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. So in those six things, do you have a biblical worldview? Because there's only a small percentage of those who profess to be Christians that do. Y'all, Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and then he says he is the life. And as I've always read this, as I've always seen this, I just see it as Jesus saying, I'm the way to the truth, who is me, which will bring the life. The life is found in Jesus. You go back to John 1. It says, in the light is life, and the light is Jesus. The light is the word. Jesus is the one who satisfies us. He's the one that meets our desires, that satisfies our desires. You see, desires have been placed in us by God because we've been created in his image to be in relationship with him. And so God has created us to desire him. And yet we try to satisfy these desires in a multitude of other ways by trying to to grab something out of this world and make it that which will satisfy us. And it won't. Only God can satisfy us. And Jesus says the only way to get to God is through him, believing in him putting full faith in him, putting your full weight and trust in who Jesus is and what he says. Because there are people who are going, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I just don't follow everything he says. And the last part of this I want to talk about is this. There are a lot of people that say, well, yeah, Jesus is different than the God of the Old Testament because Jesus, Jesus just, I mean, he's just about love. He's just about, oh, it's all about love and, and all about embracing and love. Here's the thing. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law. Jesus came to satisfy the law because the law had to be satisfied and it could only be satisfied by one who was sinless and one who gave his life as the Lamb of God so that we could be forgiven and receive grace and mercy. That's it. And the Old Testament law is good. It creates parameters around our lives so that we don't get outside of what God wants us to do because in order to have those those barriers and those parameters, those guardrails, to have those guardrails around us, then we can love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself. I hear people all the time, that's the passage they quote. No, no, but Jesus only owned two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And they fail to continue to finish that scripture, which says this. And if you do these two things, all the law and the prophets will be fulfilled. It sounds like it's important for the law and the prophets to be fulfilled. And it can be done by loving God with everything you are and loving your neighbor as yourself. You see, the way that our hearts become less troubled is by believing, truly believing in God and Jesus, by trusting that this world that we see right now is not it that God's got something more for us and we can experience his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven until we get to heaven. And heaven is really, really good. And so if you're caught up in the things around you and if you're stressed and worried and, 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 and feel overwhelmed by what's going around you, I just want to tell you and implore you, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe. And begin to walk in it. Begin to trust in it. Because if not, you're going to be one of these percentiles. And you're going to say, oh yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. And people can ask you questions about what that looks like in your life. And you're going to like, I go to church. That doesn't satisfy it. At the very end of this passage, this is what Jesus says. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, 
you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is saying, you've been with me for two and a half years. You should know me. And I've told you that I and the Father are one. And so if you know me, you know the Father. But what you're saying is you don't know me because you don't know the Father. Do you know Jesus? We talk about reading the Word. We talk about reading Scripture all the time. And the reason is not because you're obligated to read Scripture, not because it will, it will make your life better and it will fix everything. No, the reason we read Scripture is it is the story of God, that story that God reveals Himself in this, and we can understand and grow to understand who He is so that we can believe even more fully in who He is. Do you believe? Because that's the first step that your heart will not be troubled. This image of the house back in the Old Testament is the image of the tabernacle, the image of the tent of meeting. And God says multiple times in the Old Testament, he said, I will dwell with my people and they will dwell with me. And what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to go prepare a place so that we can live together and we can dwell together and we can love one another and be in relationship with each other. And in so doing, that you will love one another just as I've loved you as Jesus challenged the disciples in the previous passage. And Jesus showed us what this was to fully believe. Remember, he's fully God. Jesus' heart was troubled at one time. Jesus was troubled in his spirit at one time. Jesus knows what this, is look, what this looks like, but he knows the Father. And he trusts the Father, and so therefore he lives in peace. And Jesus was able to trust the Father to the degree that you and I will never understand by saying, okay, God, I trust you, and I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to die for all of humanity and for the sin and for the death so that they can live. And he went and did it. 